All right. So I've got duct tape over my mouth. This is Diego's show. What? This is the, this is the, the Evan and Diego show. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But the show notes are all about Diego. Are there show notes? They were. <laughs> so, have you, have you been on this show before, Graham? Well, I didn't know if there was a... <laughs> what? I'm oh. prepared to like explain what stellar convection is on rapidly rotating. <laughs> I was gonna go I just spontaneously bust into stellar rotation star. <laughs> what did you say? <laughs> <laughs> Hello, dearies. Welcome to Undersampled Radio episode. Oh, uh, what episode is this? Yeah, we're live right now. Hold on, audience. We are live to the world on YouTube at the moment. So um, it is episodes. So let me try that again. Wait, uh, hang on, hang on. Before you do try it again, I think uh, it's actually episode 76. It is. And the when, notes are where did you, what did you even do to press play? I pressed the broadcast button on the computer that's doing the thing. Hello, dearies. Welcome to, S screw it. We're just going to, we're going to roll that whole thing. We're going to roll the credits there, baby. <laughs> um, we have Diego Castaneda and Evan Bianco who you may have met before here on the show. Uh, and we have some show notes, too. Evan, you want to see the show notes? Hmm. I read them in the taxi over. I oh, see. Yeah. Um, so Evan and Diego had an hour-long taxi ride to get. <laughs> As you can see, we are all together. Where are we, guys? Houston? Yeah. Oh, Houston, Texas. 75% of us are in Houston right now. Yeah. <laughs> And we have our Nova Scotian contingent as well. Where is the Expero office in Houston? So we're also at Expero's office in Houston, <laughs> as you can tell by, by the big poster that is the foreground. To, it was, what would that be? The midground to the amazing view of the city. Can you see the city, Matt? Sort of. It's a bit blown out. Okay. So. What I'm going to do is I'm going to use this remote control <laughs> to remote control this camera. I'm going to zoom it in on the city. Oh, that's the wrong way. I think that's Wait, max zoom. Oh, no, you've got a few more. Oh, okay, well, that's all you get, and you still can't see it. digital zoom now. Mm -hmm. All right, I'm backing out. I'm backing out. Um, what was the question again? Is that in the show notes? Where, where is 550 where is Westcott. Yeah. So uh, it's, uh, it's right next to Memorial Park. Oh, OK. Nice. We've traveled down from the woodlands this evening, and when I put the address in, I'm like, oh, we're going to downtown Houston. That's how far away the woodlands is from downtown Houston. We're actually nowhere near downtown. That's right. <laughs> One finger's width on the map from uh, the woodlands mm -hmm. looks like downtown. Yeah, totally. Yeah, that's a ways out. Um, and you guys, are, when are you flying back to Nova Scotia? Tomorrow? Tomorrow, 7 a.m. Nice. So guess what we're doing tonight? <laughs> we're out going to the airport. <laughs> um, the slow way. Well, that's cool. It looks like it's uh, it looks like a nice sunny afternoon. So, Matt, how have you been? Uh great. You know, do, writing the usual proposals and trying to keep up on following up on proposals and. Uh, yeah, one of those usual weeks. You have a CRM software. Hey, do you do you have a software to manage your leads? I know I don't do anything like that. that um, yeah. I am not a great user of sort of productivity software. I, it takes me a while to adopt and then adapt, and most of it falls by the wayside. So I've tried a lot of things. Do you recommend anything? Writing a custom Postgres database. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. That's what I need. That's what I need is a software project yeah. to manage my software projects. Yeah, um, yeah. Do you just manage them all in an IPython notebook. Uh -huh. <laughs> oh I bet you've got yours in a graph database. Uh, speaking of, <laughs> hey, speaking of uh, big computers, um, we fired up an Amazon uh, X1e. 32 extra large today. That was okay. my first time ever. Four yeah. terabytes of it. it was pretty exciting. Like, I don't know, that the data center was in Oregon, and I think I could hear it spin up when we launched it. <laughs> it was a low frequency hum. It was pretty amazing. Um, 
So how do you connect that to like a file system that is big enough to load four terabytes of data? You have to just put it all. I mean, if you want to do anything quickly, you just have to load it all into a normal storage. Yeah. Mm, that's pretty good. At what point does their, uh, what's it called? Is it Snowball? Yeah. What point does that kick in? Where, where does that become uh, cost effective? I don't know. We should try it. I want to try the snowmobile. I'm thinking yeah. it's it's uh, it's more than four terabytes, though. I would have thought. Uh, the snowballs come. At, I think the average is like eighty terabytes or something. Okay. Yeah, it's quite substantial. Well, I definitely don't have that much data. You guys know anything? Oh, we talked about it on the show before. Do you know what it is? No, ephemeral storage make a really good for <laughs> okay, so um, the I could not hear that. Amazon, good. The Amazon snowmobile is like the Amazon snowball, except that it's a truck. It's an eighteen wheeler that drives yeah. up, and you transfer like exabytes. Yeah, because it's <laughs> the only efficient way to do that. Yeah, it plugs into the giant USB three. <laughs> socket on the outside of your building <laughs> and all the data comes out yeah no that means like it's like sending a giant hard drive yeah across truck size hard drive yeah <laughs> what's happening with you matt uh well i uh, just finished i wrote the uh, june tutorial for the uh leading edge I sort of felt like it needed a bit of a a reboot just because it was getting a little bit out of control Absolutely. with, well, just uh, the articles were getting longer and longer. And then it sort of all culminated with the three-parter on FWI. <laughs> you know, sort of just about, I think we just about shoehorned that into the definition of tutorial. Um, you know, bleeding edge code things that take hours to run <laughs> using multiple languages. Um, anyway, so the, so the latest one or the next one is going to be on signal processing. Uh, it's sort of a continuation of a session from ages ago at Denver SCG um, that uh, Mikko van der Baan organized on signal processing and time frequency analysis, so time frequency representations, for which he made a little repository of um, what he called benchmark signals. So these were text files containing signals like um, the Tohoku earthquake and uh, what else was in there. Uh, there was some a voice recording. Uh, there was some microseismic. There was a synthetic sort of chirp and then a couple of other things I can't remember. And um, it was cool, but none of it had a license. You didn't know where it had come from. None of the signals had their sample rate recorded with them. So you didn't, if you didn't have his original instructions, you didn't know what the sample rate was. So they were, and it was just a series of, of amplitudes. So there was no way of reconstructing the data. So uh, the thing I'm really excited about, well, not excited, but I mean, I'm, I'm, keen on in this tutorial is that I've assembled a new set of signals, some of them geophysical, some of them weird, um, which are all openly licensed. Are there and any from this show? What? Are there any from this show? No, I didn't think of that. Thinking. <laughs> like the signals you're sending me right now. That's a good idea. Um, yeah, so all openly licensed and all with the metadata kind of stored with them. And uh, and m mostly sort of vaguely interesting. So uh, hopefully that will be fun. And hopefully some more will come out of the woodwork after people see it and are like, oh, I should, you know, nominate or send in this other interesting signal. One of them is from the LIGO experiment, the uh, gravitational wave detectors. And... Um, I was going to talk to Diego about that later because I've been reading a lot about it and I'm all interested in it again. Great. Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> and, um... 
the, and I just saw, I just read today, because uh, I was following up on that, that there's not been a gravitational wave detected since the the one that I've included in that repo, um, which was in August. So, you know, there should be one along any time now. So the universe is pretty quiet, eh? Do you want to um, do you want to introduce our guests? Uh, yeah, sure. Uh, well, I think uh, we've already met um, Evan Bianco sitting at the end of the table there, um, who uh, has been with Agile since the beginning, essentially. And uh, on Graham's left, our right, it's Diego Castaneda, who's been with Agile for the last couple of years in some capacity. We hired him in December, and um, as you can see, they're in Houston with uh, with Graham. Just for, just for the podcast. Yes. Just for the podcast, yeah. Yeah. It's big. That was, in retrospect, that was a weird decision. <laughs> but it's done now. We never come to Mahon Bay for the podcast, Matt. Uh, <laughs> Why didn't we think of that? <laughs> <laughs> okay. So, any background on what these people do or anything? Like, hmm. We that, I guess? What, well, we've met Evan before, so um, we already know what he does. Uh, D Diego, what do you do? What do I do? Um, well, depends. Right now or along the way, I've, I think I've done uh, a few different things. How many operating <laughs> systems? All of them. Oh, everyone. Okay. All yeah. of them. Good. Uh, yeah. No. So, uh, okay. So, right now, yeah, I'm working uh, mostly on data science, machine learning, web development um, stuff these days. But along the history of my life, I've encountered myself doing a bunch of things, mostly computer related. Uh, but I also happen to be very interested in astronomy since I was a kid. So I decided to go all the way and do a PhD in astronomy, uh, astrophysics, doing computational uh, analysis of rapidly rotating stars. <laughs> you uh, you got to third base, as they say in academia. <laughs> right. Yeah. <laughs> uh, but, yeah. Before. <laughs> but along the way, I think like I just love the idea of using computers for everything. <laughs> uh, and and so so moving away from astronomy into like this more computational stuff that I'm doing now. Uh, so it was more uh, about looking for a more exciting, uh, fast-moving environment, I think. And machine learning, of course. I don't know if you have heard. Uh, <laughs> oh. Uh, <laughs> how, how rapidly are these stars rotating? Uh, depends. Uh, the ones that rotate, like, there is a, a limit at which a star can rotate before it starts falling apart. Um, uh, a, a star <laughs> of the size of the sun or the mass of the sun, uh, if you were standing at the equator, uh, could uh, be spinning at 200, 300 kilometers per second. Oh, man, that'll get you um, there. Right. So how, how many rotations would that be? Per so that's the thing. Yeah. So because the radius is so large in kilometers per second, that is actually like not a giant angular velocity, but it can spin on the order of uh, hours. Um, so one so hours for one rotation. Yeah. So the for comparison, uh, parts of our sun rotate once a month. Um, so for a star to rotate in in matter of hours, that's that's quite quite a change. Yeah. Right. Right. What? How? I. I mean, does it just depend on the dynamics of its formation? How? What determines how fast a star is spinning? That it's still part of the debate because some of them are spinning so fast that no one really understands how they got that much angular momentum. Um, but yeah, like the I think the, the the most accepted idea is that when you have this collapsing gas, um, you start to accumulate a lot of angular momentum and you preserve it. Um, hmm. Part of the challenges is some of these stars are. Uh, can be really old and still be spinning pretty uh, fast. Um, and our thinking is that there has to be something allowing this to happen because there's a lot of processes inside that should be 
stopping star from uh, spinning so fast. And some of them are not stopping. Like internal. Hmm. Yeah. So like spinning and this reminds me of my favorite cooking trick ever <laughs> to tell if an egg is boiled or not. You spin it. Huh? Oh, oh, that makes sense. Huh? Yeah. yeah it's yeah. pretty good, right? You got that, Matt? Uh, what, 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 what is the test? So if you, if you spin a hard boiled egg, it spins. If you okay. spin uncooked egg, it doesn't spin. Yeah. Because the angular moment is redistributed. Huh. Interesting. Like stars. Yeah. But w yeah, that's it. So is, is that, is it the same effect that you get in a star? Cause there's no presumably plasma. Does plasma have viscosity? Yes. Um, yeah. So, so depending on which layers in the sun you are, um, convective layers will have a lot of movement inside. Uh, there are actually some stars who are mainly convective. So those are actually not very good spinners uh, because there's already a lot of uh, stuff happening, movement happening inside. Hmm. That's stars are is <laughs> mental. I can't remember why we're. Oh, m my daughter was. Uh, uh, what was she doing? Oh, she did a presentation at school about the sun, and um, so we calculated. For her, for as a as a sort of factoid for her presentation, we calculated uh, how far away the sun would be if the Earth was like the size of her. Does that make sense? Right. So, like, if the Earth had her diameter, her t height as its diameter, then the sun would be like sixteen kilometers away. I think it was, and um, you know, we were because of that looking up some other stuff. And we were looking for the largest stars because we found that chart. Have you ever seen that chart that sort of, you know, starts with the Earth and then it shows you how big the sun is and you're like, whoa, that's really massive. Um, and then it's like, well, here's how big, you know, Alpha Centauri is. And here's how big that star in Cygnus, whatever it's called. And it's like, it basically, if it was in our solar system, it goes to pretty much to Saturn. Yeah, yeah, you can, we can go to that. Yeah. <laughs> it just doesn't make any doesn't make any sense. What was the other cool thing in her presentation was do you know what percentage of the solar system's mass the sun is? Oh, good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I don't I would say 99% or 95% something like that. Yeah, it's 99.86. Wow. <laughs> it's just crazy. Crazy. The universe is, yeah, is really good. Um, so <laughs> on that bombshell, <laughs> is so the thing that I wanted to ask about convection in a star is: is there is there any relationship between the convection uh, in a star like our sun and its magnetic field? Is is that a yeah. thing? So actually, for our sun um, in the solar system the magnetic field of the sun is directly related to the convective layers on the surface of the sun. So, okay. um, so, so it's not magnetic all the way through. No. So I think like the lines will like go deep just because the magnetic field is so strong. Uh, hmm. but all of this material is basically just ionized plasma that is moving very fast inside. And especially in the convective layers, the, the, the blobs of energy actually move everywhere um, to transfer the heat from the deeper layers to the uh, higher layers. So that all of that movement treat like giant currents and magnetic field uh, lines all over the place. Um, and I'm thinking that the field, the origin of the field is more sort of electrostatic the like in the earth i think it's coming from nickel and iron and it's more of a sort of i don't know what you'd call that but it's like a, it's a metallic magnetic. origin a magnetic origin and the sun i assume it's not anything to do with ferromagnetism no so so it's very likely that um even if the primordial uh like cloud form from which the sun was made could have had some magnetic properties, but most of the uh, 
magnetism, extreme magnetism happening in the sun is like product of the like energy transport transport uh, mechanism uh, itself hmm. uh, in the outer layers. Well, actually, like a big chunk of the of uh, the interior of the sun is just convection, um, and, right. and that makes up a lot of the like currents that cause all of this magnetic activity. And the sun doesn't have magnetic poles like the Earth, right? It's, it's all just... No, and actually, because the sun is actually spinning as well, uh, all of this convection and the spinning motions of uh, like internal rotation, all of that makes this magnetic field to be uh, dependent in time. Uh, so like you may have heard that uh, the sun actually has a cycle where the magnetic pole mm. in like reverse every 11 years. Uh, and all of this, even though it's poorly understood, it's thought that it's related to all of these spinning motions and combined with the convection and all of this. Oh, I see. Because presumably you can accelerate like shells or right. blobs or something. Like yeah. That. Yeah. So like it actually like the sun spins like something that we call like cylindrical rotation, which is like uh, uh, depending on how far away you are from the uh, axis uh, of the spinning axis, uh, you're rotating at a different velocity. Um, so all of this laminal uh, movement uh, causes tons of changes of, uh, of how you transfer this energy and how you move stuff around. Is that studied with like fluid mechanics? Yeah, yeah, they I spin think. an egg on the table and they see how fast the <laughs> yolk goes compared to the shell. <laughs> and, and that's it, yeah. Like Navier Stokes equation or is it not quite? Yeah, no. Like, well, well, the interior can be modeled as a, as a fluid. gas, as a fluid. Yeah. And even though there will be like a bunch of complicated uh, things added because gravity is involved heavily into how how all of this moves basically uh, but yeah all the hydrostatic equilibrium equations that you have to solve are just uh, radiative transfer assuming that uh, the plasma is almost an ideal gas um, but it's not and it becomes really challenging to model those things so so my advisor he actually um, he created this code in fortran um, of course where he uh, he had been working on it for the last like 20 more years um to create like a 2.5 d uh code to simulate all of this movement and to include rotation and how that would affect the stellar evolution of any kind of star hmm. and so and all of this is relevant now because and this is perhaps the only connection that I've encountered immediately with what you guys tend to work on, which is seismic. Um, these days, there are um, like telescopes in space, like Kepler. Uh, they are very good at looking at stars for very long periods of time, and you can see light variations that are caused by having a star in not perfect hydrostatic equilibrium and that makes stars uh, pulsate a little bit so they change they vary their light uh, because they're not producing the same amount of energy all the time uh, and that makes the star actually pulsate so they change their physically light. in size exactly and if you model those pulsations you're actually directly modeling the internal structure of the star because very few configurations will allow the star pulsate in certain frequencies. So we can huh. do time series analysis to figure out uh, what frequencies are uh, are happening. And those frequencies can only be matched if the interior of the star is a certain way. Uh, so these days, crazy. What, what wavelength, or, I mean, what um, time period are we talking about? Um, so it can be hours, there are hours or days, um, depending on, I guess, the, the size of the star and also the type of the pulsation, because if these waves are caused in the 
depths, like very deep inside of the star, uh, you will find low frequencies. And if they're happening at very close to the surface, you find high frequency modes uh, of pulsation. Uh, so huh. you, you actually, depending on the frequency, you know if you're mapping close to the core of the star or uh, close to the surface of the star. Can you delineate differences in the lum like luminosity changes for one star? Um, so, so, like for instance, could you simultaneously map surface related changes and core yeah. related changes? Yeah. yeah, because the frequency there is there is a lot of math behind how you can model these things, but uh, people find that the the core modes that people in my field call G modes, they're the gravity cost modes because it's uh, convection uh, changes in convection in the interior that cost them. Uh, these G modes actually have uh, fairly low amplitudes compared to the high frequency modes in most cases, depending on the star. Um, so, but all, all like we don't even care about the amplitude of the uh, pulsational activity. We only care about the frequency hmm. uh, because it's through these frequencies that we can map all of these different configurations in the interior of the star. Um, so yeah. So you're you're saying that a, a star that you could potentially only image with one pixel in some detection system, you can map its interior just from its luminosity. Yeah, just from counting, like variation. That is bananas. Yeah, and 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 Kepler, which you may have heard, like a, a space telescope called Kepler that has been revolutionary, mm -hmm. uh, like planetary search outside of the solar system um, right. for uh, stellar, like this field is called astro seismology. Uh, for <laughs> astro seismology, it has also been like a revolution because huh. uh, all we want is to look at a star for as long as possible so that when we make a yeah. transform, we will find those frequencies as accurate as possible. Is there a is there an upper limit, or or do we just loop, stop recording? I think the upper limit. So in time, there is no upper limit. Yeah. The more time, the better. Uh, it's it then becomes it's more about the se sensitivity, so that you can see now like the the low amplitude uh, pulsations uh, and map them in time as well. That's crazy. So you're um, learning now? So no, that was one of the things that got me interested in machine learning was because I was actually not doing anything related to machine learning during my uh, my PhD, uh, but I had to do a lot of manual like labeling of uh, the calculated modes with the computer and try to match them with observations. And a lot of these processes were like like I know that a computer could do a better job than what I'm doing right now. Um, so, so I started like uh, a couple of years before I finished, I started exploring these ideas um, and, and then it just became also a hobby of doing machine learning of anything. Hmm. Yeah, awesome. Yeah, that's, that's amazing. Well, maybe, um, maybe we can get one of those signals for my little collection. Yeah, no, you could totally. Like, totally. Sun, we actually know the composition of the sun down to, I don't remember how many decimals, um, just through analyzing the light variations in the surface. And That's those crazy. variations, like, we match them with a solar model that can only explain those variations. And, and that gives you a composition, uh, it gives you a, a high certain. Uh, estimate of how the internal structure is, so like where the elements are, like where the hydrogen core uh, is, and yeah, no. yeah. yeah, that's incredible. Um, now, aren't there also sort of quakes, like sun quakes, from more sort of impulsive events, explosions and flares and whatnot? Um, do do people use those for imaging too in any way? I, I don't know. Like, I feel like 
it's hard to model those. I think that maybe if you catch them in time, you can use them to see how they propagate. Um, okay. Surface, I imagine. Uh, and I'm sure that like there, there's people trying to model those events specifically. Uh, but I think in terms of astro seismology, like for the general overview of the internal structure, like you you care more about the, the periodic nature of the other uh, events. Toss it in an LSTM. <laughs> yeah. I was writing an LSTM earlier uh, using none other than TensorFlow eager execution mode. Like you <laughs> like you compared to PyTorch. <laughs> I'm not I'm not going back to PyTorch. Really? Yeah. It's awesome. Have you used it yet? No. I know that it's there but I haven't. So I taught a PyTorch class on Friday. Uh, it went horribly by the way. What <laughs> I was yeah. gonna ask. So what do you mean? I didn't realize they released version zero point four two days before my course. So all of the material that we wrote was broken. Oh, no. Uh, so anyway, we kind of just dealt with it on the fly. Uh, but anyway, <laughs> I, lo I love PyTorch. I think it's wonderful. Uh, but that's, that's done. <laughs> yeah, eager execution mode is stinking awesome. Use it. All right. Got that, Matt? Right. Yeah. Uh, I'm doing it right now. And I see a note on here uh, that you'll be able to run eager execution mode on Ubuntu 18. <gasps> yeah. Uh, well, I yeah, I haven't I haven't uh, done that yet, but it's on my to do list for this weekend. To get my machine set up on this upgrade on 18. Uh, yeah, mainly just because you just do it. Uh, have the, have had this machine for a while and just need to put something on it. Um, but I need, I need my other machine back, and then my 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 old backup machine has been adopted by my middle daughter, the same one that did the sun uh, presentation. She's uh, she started learning Python like crazy. She's yes. suddenly gone, she's suddenly gone Python crazy. So it's that's been really fun. What is she making? When can we hire her? <laughs> <laughs> she's, uh, she's mostly been looking at. Games, although she's also quite interested in plotting because they do stuff on what they call data management at school. You know, they do some sort of data analysis. So she's quite interested in that. Um, but yeah, she made a, um, well, a couple of the classics, Hangman Game. Yeah. And uh, what was the other one? Oh, Rock, Paper, Scissors, you know, that old chestnut. And she's been looking at turtles, you know, which are quite good fun for kids. But it's amazing how quickly kids grasp things. Like almost, almost just like instant. Um, it, it goes in once, and then she's she's got it. Yeah, it's, uh, so, yeah, it's it's really cool to see, and makes me realize that grown ups are really not learning machines like kids are. Um, so anyway, that's that's been cool. So I don't know. She may she may adopt that that computer at some point. She doesn't have a computer of her own yet. Um, yeah. Uh, install Ubuntu eighteen on that one too. Uh, yeah. I don't know. We'll see how this other one goes. Normally, I would wait till like the dot one release of something to install it. That's what I normally do with uh, with the Mac. Uh, operating systems don't usually go for the dot zero, but um, so yeah, we'll see how it goes. Maybe with the first one, it's just for your kids, though, right? You deploy on version zero, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, obviously, yeah, no, but for her, yeah, I wait would, until uh, just upgrade over on this laptop, and then I realized that this is controlling our broadcast, so. <laughs> <laughs> and so yeah, and I uh, while I was Sniffing around the kind of what's coming up for releases, I saw Python 3.7s are going to be out pretty soon. Oh, <laughs> like, yeah. like, yeah, they're already testing like next month. Yeah, I think they're on like release candidate one. Let me schedule a, a intro to Python course the day before it comes out. <laughs> Just, Python's but I, yeah, there's not many people that upgrade to Python right away, though. 
it blows me away how many people are still on 2.7 yeah <laughs> in fact i just i just read this kind of cool oh, i should put a link to it because the thing i was reading uh earlier oh is that mit mathematician at mit young guy called adam oh man i can't remember anyway he's he's written a python uh library or tool for making parsimonious turing machines <laughs> so he makes he makes turing machines that only use a single tape and uh two symbols so a and b or whatever um and then tries to write Turing machine, essentially his his code, his Python library lets you uh, write a high level description of your Turing machine. And then his code compiles it down into an actual two state, or, sorry, two symbol, uh, one tape Turing machine. Or well, actually you can use any number of symbols you want, but apparently mathematicians are most interested in two symbols. So he's 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 written this paper that like simultaneously shows what the, um, essentially maximum number of states needed in a Turing machine is to um, find counterexamples to the Riemann hypothesis, the Goldback conjecture, and some other things that I'd never heard of. But it's pretty it's pretty cool. He's done a couple of he's clearly <laughs> just one of those people who's just ultra intelligent. His YouTube videos describing his paper are very uh, actually understandable and sort of awesome so i really recommend them i'll i'll put the i'll put the link in the what's name when i find it anyway sorry i don't know how i got into that subject but computers are awesome oh he was using python 2.7 i was like dude yeah that's it like let's not discuss that anymore <laughs> it's like come on your folks had lunch with john d cook today say that again I had lunch with John D. Cook today. Oh, cool. Awesome. Is that the first time you met him? Yep. He turned out to be in person just as awesome and funny as his blog is. Yeah, I bet. What's CPH? That guy is a, that guy is a prodigious blogger. It's quite... Well, like I, I think he blogs basically every day, right? Almost. Yeah. Well, he also has 19 Twitter accounts. <laughs> right. 19, yeah, yeah. That's not a joke. That's not an exaggeration. It's 19. Exactly. Yeah. Why? Why not? Marketing. No, but they're, they're on specific topics. Like, it's like awesome stuff about computer science, awesome stuff about graph theory, physics. But, okay, so I asked him about that. I said, how many people do you have employed just writing Twitter posts? <laughs> Guess how many? Don't tell me he does it all. Zero. What? Yeah. That's amazing. All of that. That's amazing. Well, then, well, then the question is, how much work do you do? Yeah. <laughs> Copenhagen. Tell me about Copenhagen. Uh. Oh, okay. I got more questions about about John Cook, but um. <laughs> uh, well, so Copenhagen um, is obviously coming up. These things, these the spring events that we've been looking forward to for so long are coming up very quickly. Um, we have a new sponsor for Copenhagen, which is kind of fun because it's another um, operator, uh, Wintersal, uh, a German oil and gas company, well, energy company, part of the BASF, which is a sort of giant organization, I guess. Um, and yeah, that's pretty exciting because they called me kind of out of the blue thinking about hackathons and um, inviting them to the Copenhagen event and to sort of sponsor it and come and take part in it. It seemed like a, an obvious easy thing for them to do in the near term. So they're doing that. And they sound like a really great bunch of people. So they're going to bring a few people along and um, provide some some problems that they're interested in for people to hack on. and. Uh, a, a bit of money to help out with the uh, with the venue, so yeah, it's exciting. And also, uh, Teradata are going to be sponsoring again um, the, with uh, with the, by buying the t-shirts. So that's very nice of them. That's what they did last year in Paris, um, and we'll have them back. Hacking 
Duncan Irving and co uh, in, in the room with everybody as well. So, yeah, and now I think we've got a full stable and the the event is back at break even, which is always a relief. Um, and we're going to have, uh, there's going to be a lot of people. I'm still toying with the idea of moving to six people per team, which I'm a bit reluctant to do, but it might be a necessity just to keep the number of teams down. What date? What's the date? This is the 8th, 9th, 10th of June. Oh, man. So here in my inbox, you'll see, I have someone just uh, <laughs> just earlier today said that June 10th is when he'll be shipping me a oh. commercial 3D camera. <laughs> that uh, sounds pretty cool. It's going to be awesome. Can you ship it to... I feel like even if it had been June 7th, though, I mean, let's face it, you're going to need a month just to right. <laughs> finish, yeah, whatever. And this guy brought Figuring the out what it does. In Austin, and it was so, I mean, I didn't know he was bringing a camera. Like, he just came over, I thought we were just going to talk, uh, and he just, like, whips out this bag, and the camera's in it, and he's got a tripod, and he sets it up, and we're, like, imaging our hands and markers and stuff on the table. Um it's amazing. Like you get a full 3D point cloud, but it's also full color spectrum too. So everything's texturized. Oh, that's cool. We didn't how, how big is it? Or like the camera? It's like this. And sorry, what do you do? How does it capture 3D? You move it around? No, it just it has, sits there. It has two uh, ah. sensors. Okay. Wow. So it's like a pair of eyes or whatever. Well, yeah, but. That doesn't make enough sense to me. So <laughs> check this out. Not enough. So check this out. So it also broadcasts signal, monochromatic light that's modulated, right? And obviously he, you know, he didn't tell me what the secret sauce was or whatever. But when it when it goes, you can see that there's some wild modulation going on because it does all these crazy angles and stuff and there's like different frequencies of light. It's really cool. Is that like the red blue glasses at the yeah yep like different wavelengths of something or other mm -hmm. and in fact you don't need different wavelengths if you have modulated signals that one you know one receiver picks up and the other receiver doesn't pick up tick tick, tick back and forth um, I at least I imagine that's how it happens um, but that's pretty cool so I'm gonna um, I don't know image some stuff. And I'm going to use some deep learnings and yeah. eager execution. Eagerly execute my project in 3D vision. Yeah. yeah. I'll measure the dimensions of my face. Yeah, I haven't really kept up, but it feels like there's quite a few different strategies that people are using f for capturing 3D scenes. Yeah. And I don't really know how they kind of all compare and stack up. You know, because people use like different viewpoints and then there's a stereoscopic thing and then there's like range detection and then people are doing range detection with machine learning. So just based on other scenes that they do know the depth on. Um, yeah, so I, um, and then, then there's stuff like, uh, what's that technology that Google just bought? Lytro, uh, the, the depth, uh, what's it called? full field imaging or whatever, wave field wow. imaging. Depth field camera. Yeah. And um, yeah, it feels like there's a lot of different technologies out there. And I guess, I don't know exactly, I guess humans are just using stereoscopic imaging. Although we know we use parallax as well. And I feel like you also use sound a little bit, don't you? No, I'm just thinking about how I, like, even when I'm sitting still, I feel like I know that the scene in front of me is three-dimensional, yeah. right? Even when I'm not looking at things, actually, it's kind of a weird perception mm -hmm. that we have. Anyway, it's all very cool, but, um, and it seems like the self-driving cars are still using LiDAR, I think, for the most part. Yeah. Um, anyway. There's a lot of stuff people are throwing at that problem. Yeah, that's a tough one. Didn't we read that they were also testing, I think, GPR technology for? Oh, yeah. Well, no, that was for location. Oh, but there was. Stay on the road. But but that's good for autonomous driving. Where they have side scanners? 
I don't remember. No. You don't so, want the retroactive solution. No, no. What they do, Graham, it's totally amazing. They do a, a GPR on the road as you're going along. And then once they've done that, they've basically got like a barcode, like a 2D barcode of the oh, entire road. That's and awesome. Yeah. And they can locate themselves to like centimeters at driving speed. Oh, man. Yeah. It's pretty cool. And that's you can also find landmines. But of course, you're oh, going to. I get landmines. But you're still going to call you before you do. That, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Diego, what are you reading? Uh, what am I reading? Uh, actually, a book that Matt lent me, um, oh. Code. Uh, that's pretty neat. It tells you about coding situations, I think. Like, I don't even know how to describe what <laughs> the book tells you about. Uh, but it's, it's a yeah, pretty neat collection of how mentally you prepare for uh, designing algorithms and end up programming computers. Cool. Yeah, it's it, like you have, have. It's totally worth reading that book if you haven't read it. Charles Petzold. It's like a history of computers, sort of. But he tells the history. It's like a history of computers and computing, but told with light bulbs and batteries. Yeah. And you know, it's like how to build a logic gate with just wires. It's really, it's really awesome. Cool. Evan, what are you reading? Nothing. Oh, that was my answer. Do you have any recommendations? No, I was going to ask you for a recommendation. I just I don't know what I need another new book to read. So maybe I'll put something up. OK, Matt. I'm I just finished the book last night. Um, another Magnus Mills. So I, I already waxed on about Magnus Mills, but I, it, the one I read was called. Uh, oh, Explorers of the New Century. Very strange. Very strange, but really good. Good deal. Um, does anyone what have about you? Oh, you're reading nothing. You said I'm reading nothing. I'm looking. I also am looking for a new. What have you? I have. I. I'm on. A, I've been on a bit of a book buying. We have. Uh, we have run out. We have officially run out of book space in our house. Um, <laughs> I, I'd say about three months ago we like ran out, and now it's get. It's actually a problem. There's stacks of books in pl places where there sh shouldn't be. Build a anything. new staircase. What? <laughs> Build a new staircase. A new staircase? Oh, <laughs> actually, not a terrible idea. I'm not a handy person. I can't really build things, even just out of books. Well, <laughs> I mean, it's like it's like uh, Lincoln Logs, man. Didn't you ever play with Lincoln Logs? Are those the fuzzy bricks? No, no. <laughs> no <that is. laughs> Do you remember those things? They're little bricks with stickle bricks. They were called, I think. Oh no, maybe that was an English thing. Yeah, they were like, uh, you know, like a nail brush. Refrigerator for too long. <laughs> they were like funny little bricks that you stuck together. Very weird. Made of plastic. Probably hey, terrible. Matt. Hey Matt. Mm hmm. If your head was the size of an entire wall. What would you do with it? Oh, right. I've got a wall-sized head right now. I forgot that. Where you sign off? A photo op? Oh, I took a photo. But we're going to have another photo op. So if it, if it wasn't really gross, I'd put my, head. I'd put my mouth right up to the camera. But I'm not doing that because that would be horrible. <laughs> That's what I want to do. Maybe I can just do my eye. Just, just go. go for it. Yeah, go for it. <laughs> 